You know, God is a giver. God is a giver. For God so loved the world. Help me finish it. For God so loved the world, he, he gave. Generosity will never be to the dimension in your heart and life God designed for it to be unless it's looked through the lens of grace. Grace is what changes our generosity. Our generosity and our giving, uh, giving is not determined by debt to income ratios. It's not determined by financial formulas or leading economic indicators. It has nothing to do with tax brackets, though those things have their place. Generosity has to do with understanding the grace of God that has worked in our lives and the things that God has entrusted us to manage and steward. The thing about generosity is God wants to talk to you and I, not only about what's in our hands, God wants to talk to you and I about what's in our hands so he can get to us what's in his hands. And that's why he wants to talk to you about your hands, your heart, when it comes to generosity. You got to realize that generosity and stewardship is not about God trying to get from us. It's God trying to give to us. Not that he's trying to get from us. God's trying to give to us. I want you to think about the amount of time in Scripture that Jesus spoke on possessions and finances. And, uh, as you think about this, and we'll highlight this in just a moment, but it's one of the reasons the enemy, in my opinion, has worked so hard throughout the generations to place a stigma upon the church anytime someone would speak upon finances. There's many circles of churches in that that they're, they're actually uncomfortable and they won't do it because they know it will make the congregation uncomfortable because there's a stigma upon finances and that's something that we don't talk about because the motive is always wrong. Did you know finances is the number one reason for divorce in America? It's the number one reason. Don't you think it would be just like the enemy to want to place a stigma upon the very vehicle in place God wants to give you revelation about stewardship and money so that you would not be able for us to receive it because of the stigma that's been placed upon it? So I'm going to ask you, would you give me the permission to speak on what God talks about for us in his word when it comes to generosity? Would you, as a congregation, would you do that? Okay. It's not that I needed the permission, but I was asking because when I speak to you today about these subject matters, and I speak to you about this, it is the motive that we simply want to see what is it that God wants to get to us. Amy and I grew up, many of you know the story, very, very dysfunctional homes. We grew up most of our life in our early years never fully understanding. No one sat down to talk to us about budgets or managing or tithe or stewardship. And we had to grow into those things. Uh, and our path at times was difficult of having to grow into this. So when I share from you from God's word and I share what God says in his word, it's because I want to help you to have a little bit of an easier path than I had growing up. I want you to be able to receive the things that God has for you in your life. Jesus spoke, Jesus spoke of all of half the parables and stories. Jesus told half of them had to do with possessions and finances. And you would ask the question, why would Jesus talk to so many people in most of the red letters in Scripture on finances when he didn't need their money? Now, I'm going to ask you this question. Do you think Jesus needs your money? Do you think Jesus needed their money? Why would he talk so much? If what, for what he wanted to get from them, he wanted them to not be caught in the trap of the system of what the world does with finances. That's why Jesus talked. It's, it's not because he needed it. He didn't want them trapped by what the systems of the world teach regarding finances and possessions. Jesus didn't need their money. Why? So why would Jesus not need our money nor their money when Jesus talked about it? Because one of the hinges on stewardship and a foundational block is God is the absolute owner of everything. This is in your Bible, Colossians 1.16. In him all things were created, heaven and earth, visible and invisible, thrones, powers, rules, authorities. All things, have been, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. You're not holding anything together. We think we are, right? 
And sometimes we convince ourselves that we're doing a good job. We're not holding, listen, we don't have enough energy to blow, to blow fuzz off a peanut. <laughs> we're not holding it together. He's holding it together. Can I get an amen? amen. Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Is that the Bible? It, is that the Bible? Yes. The earth is the Lord's. And everything in it, the world and all its people belong to him. You don't even own your spouse. She's not yours. Amen. He's not yours. And some of you are saying, thank God. <laughs> they're not yours. Listen to me. Your children, they're not yours. All you have, if this passage is true, it's not ours. And what I invite you into as a pastor now of over 25 years, a Christ follower of over 30-some years, is I go through a constant reconciliation financially of what God is doing in my life and my heart. There's a spiritual reconciliation when you give your heart and life to God, but there's also a financial reconciliation. Because the more God works in your heart, the more you understand God is the owner of it all. Everything is the Lord's. Listen, the trees are His. The mountains are His. The oceans are his. Have you ever heard it said this way? That the car you're driving is his. Because the metal that was used to make the car comes from his earth. The home you have is his. Because the stone and the block and the trees came, and the lumber came from the trees that are his. It's his. It's all his. The food you eat, it's his. When's the last time you created rain? When's the last time that you got up in the morning and cascade sun, the sunlight on the fields of the Midwest? It's his. And when we understand this principle, it changes the way we view our possessions. Some of you would say, but you don't know the hours I've worked, <laughs> the education spent. You don't understand the sweat. You don't, the things I've built by the sweat, my energy. Where'd you get the energy? Where'd you get the ability? As a matter of fact, Deuteronomy 8, 18 says, I don't have this on the screen. Remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives the ability to produce wealth. So if we have any wealth today, if we have it at all, God's the one that gave us the ability. God's the one that gives us energy. God's the one that gives us creative. You say, yeah, I had a great business idea. Who gave you the business idea? Who is, who, who is the one that is innovative, that is creative, that gives us the ability for the things that we see in life. My ability, my income, my talents, my energy, all of this comes from Him. And when we understand that it comes from Him, then we know then, then our role is we're managers and we're stewards. We are stewards. 1 Corinthians 2, 4. Now a person who is put in charge as a manager must be faithful. Why is it so important that I'm taking time in the early part of this series of generosity to share this with you. Because we respond in our lives, but we either respond by the systems of the world and the way the world thinks regarding possessions and wealth and money, strategy, all those things. It's either typically the world's way or it's going to be the Lord's way. So this is why I take time. And listen, here's why. I didn't put this passage uh, on the screen, but I'm going to give you time to write it down. It's Psalm 119.45. I have gained perfect freedom by following your teachings. The way of the world, listen to me, all of you listen to me online, the way of the world will always lead you to a place of bondage. But the way of Jesus will, and his teachings will always lead you to a place of freedom. And God's heart, God's desire, my desire for you would be in the very thing that probably creates more issues within marriage and family than any other issue, we would want you to be free. We'd want you to be in a place of freedom. Therefore, generosity, when it comes to stewardship, swings on these two hinges, right? And here's the first. It's a principle of first. It's the principle of first. And if you've read The Blessed Life by Pastor Robert Morris, who it's a life message, who thankfully Amy and I were able to sit underneath his ministry um, 
um, for almost half a decade. They're five years, but it, 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 it's, it, it's, a pro, it's a profound message. And I've heard him share this since the early years when I was in Atlanta. But it simply reminds us when it comes to generosity and stewardship that God should always be demonstrated and it should be practiced within our lives that God is placed first. Proverbs 3, 5. In everything you do, say everything. everything. Say everything. everything. Won't you take a moment right now and just first before I continue and look over at the person beside you and say, I just realized you look astonishing today. Just go ahead and tell them. <laughs> I just realized it. It just dawned on me. You are astonishing today. The way you did your hair, it's fascinating today. It's unbelievable. The way you polished your head there, it's just fascinating. (laughs) Don't go there, don't go there. In everything you do, put God first. So there's the principle, right? There's the principle. That's the principle. Put God first. Say it with me. I'm going to put God first. What's the promise? I will direct you. And I will crown all of your efforts with success. There's your principle and there's your promise. Proverbs 3, 9, the living Bible, honor the Lord with your giving, giving him first part of all of your income, and he will fill your barns with wheat and barley and overflow your wine vats and with the finest wines. God says, put me first and trust me with the rest. If I'm correct, I don't have it in this teaching today, but if I'm correct, I think tithing is the only place in all of Scripture where God says, test me. It's the only place. God says, if you don't believe me, once you think about this, he owns it all. He owns it all. And he doesn't need what we have. He has a great resume and reputation, and he comes to you and says, and if you don't believe me, test me test me. Be faithful. Put me first. See if I will not take care of your life. One of the reasons for this is God knows that possessions is one of the greatest tests of priorities in our lives. If God wants to know where things are at in our heart, God then knows it will deeply be associated with possessions. What? Think about it. We spend most of our life trying to earn it. He understands within the context of how this works within our lives. And Jesus says that one of the ways that you demonstrate that I'm first is what you do with the thing in which I've blessed you with and I've trusted you with in your life. Um, I know there's someone listening that would say, but when it, tithing, Old Testament, law, New Testament, grace, we're under grace. So we're under grace, we don't talk about that no more. But if I understand grace the way Jesus taught grace, he said grace exceeds the law. So if, I, if that's the conversation that I take, grace in the New Testament, so tithe is not no longer for our day, but grace exceeds law, well then tithing is not the finish line, it's the starting line. Right? Because grace exceeds the law. God understands this connection for us with our heart. And you've got to think about this for a moment. As a pastor, as I share with you today, as Christ followers, we trust God with with eternity. Right? I trust you with my last breath if I've accepted you that I'm going to spend the rest of my life with you. I'm going to be with you in eternity versus hell. Think about this for a moment. We trust him with that capacity of eternity. Would you not think we could trust him with a bank account? I trust him with eternity? I think I can trust him with the other. Did you know, you, and you take time to read this as well. There's nowhere in scripture where God uses the word give, tithe. He always says bring. Why? Because you can't give something that's not yours. He never says give tithe. Why? Tithe is his. 
All the earth is his, everything I have, everything I've given you. So you return the tithe. He never says give, he says bring. Bring. I give in offerings. I bring this to the Lord. This is a, it's the, uh, it's the principle of first, but it's a principle of priority. This principle of priority also plays out uh, in other aspects of your life. It plays out in marriage. It's the law of priority. It's the principle of priority. It's that your spouse should be first. Amy, for whatever reason, brought up, coming over this morning, she brought up stories of when she and I were dating before we were married about the way I used to uh, have my hair. And she started talking about my hair, and she said, you had a mullet. And she said, do you remember, Clint, you didn't only have a mullet, but you went and let them put a perm in it and curl the back of it. I was driving over here thinking, is that the devil talking to me this morning, or is that, who's talking to me for it? But just, just. She said, and you let them curl it. And it got me thinking, it got me thinking about how much of a priority Amy was when she and I first started dating, even into our early part of marriage. I mean, man, I, I had every Don Johnson outfit you could come up with. <laughs> Little curls floating down in the back. and Man, I would work three hours on the car. I'd wax, I'd wax, I'd wax under the car, under the car. I'd wa and going, and Amy lived about 25 minutes from where we lived, and this is true. I do believe there were one or two times after I'd spent hours on the car, I thought it might get a little dusty right before I pick her up, and I pulled off in a parking lot, and I pulled the rag back out, and I just did just a little bit more. That's true. That's true. She was a priority to me. Now, what do you have to do in marriage the longer that you're married? You have to spend time and cultivate a heart that I keep her as priority. There was a day I wouldn't even drive up to pick her up with, unless the car had been waxed for three hours. I can't forget in 20 years later in marriage, not even go open the door for her because I'm laying on the couch watching football with potato chips in my belly button. <laughs> I'm, why? I'm trying to help somebody. I'm asking you. How many would have... I lost you right there. I lost right there. Let's go ahead and have the altar call, and let's just go ahead and do this. What I'm saying is, I'm going to say it this way. If Amy has to compete with other things, it's going to impact our relationship. And I'm going to say something. Amy's never heard me say this. I've never said this in all the years of preaching. And the Lord spoke to me this morning. He said, but you're going to say it. He said, there was a time when you were unfaithful to her. And it wasn't a physical woman. But it was a woman. And it was the church. And there were times in Atlanta where I put the church before her. And it impacted us deeply. Are you hearing me today? What I'm telling you is, God says, I don't want to compete with things. I want to know I'm not in your top five. I don't even want to be in your top three. I want to know I'm your number one. I'm your number one. I'm your number one. It's the principle of of first, it's the priority. Let me give you an Old Testament picture. It's Adam and Eve's first children. You've read this if you've read throughout the Bible, throughout, and some of you may not, so I don't assume, but this is Adam and Eve. This is their first children. Abel, keeper of sheep, Cain, tiller of the ground. Verse 3, and in the process of time, say that with me, and in the process of time, come on, let's say it. In the process of time, it came to pass, Cain brought an offering. He brought fruit of the ground. Abel brought the firstborn, say firstborn, of his flock and their fat. And the Lord respected Abel's offering. He did not respect Cain's offering. 
Why would God receive Abel's offering but not respect Cain's offering? He tells you in the passage, Cain brought his gift to God in the process of time. Let me give it to you in our language would be, it just kind of happened. He just kind of got around to it. And notice it doesn't say first fruits with Cain. That's not what it says. It's in your Bible. It says fruit. Cain brought his fruit of the ground, not first fruits. Abel brought the first of the flock. And God said, I can bless that because I'm first. What I will not bless is when you just kind of get around. God doesn't want to be fifth. God doesn't want to be third. God says, I want to be first in your life. Did you know the first murder in Scripture was over God being first? Because Cain killed Abel. First murder in Scripture. For this reason. And here's what I want you to know. This principle of first, 2,500 years before the Ten Commandments. 2,500 years before the law is ever given and God ever mentions tithe. The principle was already there. And God says, I'll bless. This principle runs all throughout Scripture. God says, put me first. Jesus comes, says a little bit of a different way. He says, seek ye, help me finish it, seek ye first the kingdom and all of his righteousness will be added to you. So here's what I want you to catch that the Lord has had to continue to talk to me about for years. If this principle's true, it's not just the amount we give. It's the order in which we give it. If this principle is true. I'm going to ask you, is God's word true? Yes. It's true. Let me ask you, do you think God wants to bless you? Yes. God says, I just want to be first. And I just don't want to compete. I just want to know that I'm first. That leads you to the second hinge on the door. And that's not just a principle of first. That's a principle of faith. And here's what I find interesting. I find it interesting that in Hebrews 11, the hall of fame of biblical heroes, who's the first person mentioned? You would think it would be Moses. How many times have you walked up to the waters and said something and they parted? When's the last time you killed a giant? And the list goes on. Of all the biblical heroes in Scripture, why would it be, and who is it that it starts with? Abel. Abel's the first mention of all of the biblical heroes. Surely, Abraham, Moses, David. Of all the heroes of faith, why would you start with Abel? Abel's resume doesn't look anything like Moses' resume. Or David, or Abraham, or any of the other prophets. Why would you start with Abel? Well, it's possible it's because Abel demonstrated what it is to live by the principle of first and practice by faith. And here's exactly what it says in, a, in Hebrews eleven four: 4. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous. When God spoke well of his offerings, and by faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. So here's the thing. Listen. There's two ways that you give and that I give when it comes to generosity. There's always two ways. One's by reason and one's by revelation. One's by reason, one's by revelation. I give by reason means I logically have to think through, does this make sense? I'm going to tell you right now, there's a whole lot in the Word of God that doesn't make sense. As a matter of fact, we live as Christ followers in an upside-down kingdom. The kingdom of God pretty much has everything reversed from the way our culture has taught us. So when it comes to giving, we are so, by, by default, by human nature, we give by reason. Does it logically make sense the way this is going to add up? Listen, listen to me. Even an atheist can do that. Even a lost person can give by reason. Christ followers, we don't give by reason. We give by revelation. And the revelation is... I'm going to put God first because I can trust him with the rest of everything else for in my life. And Abel here in this passage 
demonstrates to us what it means to walk out the principle of first. Uh, so let me read to you quickly a study that uh, I'd heard some time ago, Pastor Terry Smith, but he, he, he speaks about Arthur C. Brooks from Harvard. Now, this is a man of faith. Um, so, and here's the article. Basically, it's with this, here's, here's the framework of the article. When you give and when you're generous, here's, here's the backdrop, that you are the biggest benefactor of your own generosity. Now, don't misunderstand. We don't give to get. So I'm not talking about a motive being wrong, but I'm going to get ready to read to you a research Arthur C. Brooks did with a team from Harvard on generosity. Because remember, we don't give to get, but when you are generous, it's like a boomerang. It's coming back to you. It's going to find you when you're generous. So listen uh, to the study. Arthur C. Brooks, professor at Harvard Kennedy School, Harvard Business. He initiated the study with some Harvard colleagues on the subject of generosity. The team collected numbers and statistics of over 30,000 American families. So just hear this. 30,000 American families. A strong conclusion was formed that the people that live generously and give generously tend to prosper more. And now listen to the study. One of the areas of research explored 30,000 families, and the families were two families identical was the way that the, the study worked. And what I mean by that is they studied families identical. Same religion, same race. Um, These were the uh, uh, same education, the same number of children. I'm reading from the research here. The same town. They lived in the same town. Same religion, same race, same number of children. I mean, when they went for the research and the study, they were very specific. Everything was the exact same in the research study of the 30,000 families that they did. Two identical families. Here's the difference. One family gave $100 more to charitable giving. Listen what the research showed. The one family that gave $100 more annually than the other family earned on average at the end of the year $375 more in income than the non-giving family. Almost nearly four. Now, but here's what the research says. On income, they, they earned this more than the non-giving family, and it was statistically attributable to the gift. To the gift. And here's what's fascinating. The two families were the exact same. One gives $100 more annually than the other, but the family that gave more earned, on average, $375 more. You could take that, extrapolate that, because everybody makes different types of income, and just you could follow the path and see basically what that would come to. Here's where it gets interesting. Arthur C. Brooks is so captivated by the, by the numbers of the study, he can't get his head around it, and he actually feels like something's missing. We messed up. They go back, they look through the numbers, he cannot explain it, they run the numbers multiple times, it's all accurate. So he goes to a friend of his at Harvard who specialized in the psychology of charitable giving, and he shares the results with him, and he says, this is not making sense. I cannot explain this. Listen what, listen what Arthur Brooks says, it's as though God has his hand on the economy. And here's what he says, this is what Arthur Brooks says, he said, I, can, I just cannot believe it's true. And his Harvard colleague said, why don't you believe it's true? You're a Christian, aren't you? The study continues. Brooks then concludes his research and study and says, something bigger is going on here, and we finally have come to the conclusion of what has happened. We realize now that these outcomes and the families that gave the difference we now realize are people that practiced their faith. People that practiced their faith. People that attended church regularly, which is weekly, and they would give regularly. The study and research went to say the people that give and attend regularly, they will live happier lives, healthier lives, and more prosperous lives than all their neighbors. And Arthur C. Brooks ends the research with this statement. The main benefactor of your charitable gift is you. That's the main one. 
It takes a principle of faith. One of the main principles this time in tithing is that we practice by faith. By faith. I'm going to ask you a question. Did God give Jesus first? Did God give Jesus first? God gave Jesus in faith before that we ever believed. I'm going to ask you a question. Did God give Jesus to the world before the world had ever, one person even repented of their sins? I can show you this in scripture, Romans 5, 8. God demonstrated his own love for us while we were still sinners. Christ died for us while we were sinners. While people were mocking and spitting on Jesus and he was dying, God went ahead and gave him first. Because God believed there would be a return off of his giving because even God himself understands the principle of first. As a matter of fact, if you look in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, he's called the, he's called the first fruits offering. 1 Corinthians 15, 20, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Let me say this to you. Generosity will always involve a level of faith. It's always going to open the door for you and I to be able to practice faith. I heard Pastor Robert some time ago, he shared this as well as anybody has shared it, but I love the observation out of Genesis 26, 12. Isaac sowed in the land, and he reaped the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. The man began to prosper. Say prosper. And he continued prospering until he became very prosperous. Why do we have a problem with the word prosper when it comes to church? You know why? Because of the stigma that has been placed often upon the church. And for there to be a season of hyper teaching about prosperity. And that you give to get. And you don't just give to get. If you give enough, you'll end up in an ivory tower. And because we've had this hyper teaching, people have moved away. And when they hear the word prosper, it has a negative connotation. We don't know what to do with the word prosper. But have you ever thought about this? God uses the word prosper all the time in Scripture. God doesn't have a, God doesn't have a problem with the word prosper. Why should we? Can I show you an Old Testament passage? And you quote this and pray, and you've prayed it for years. Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans that I have for you. Plans to, help me finish it. Come on, collective as a congregation. Plans to, not harm you. I'm going to give you hope in the future. You say, yeah, that's Old Testament. Let me give you a New Testament one. Third John 1, 2. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. So why do we have a negative generosity, prospering, all this prosperity preaching? That's not what's happening today. You know what the original meaning of the word prosper is in Greek? You want me to tell you what the original? We, we have this negative experience with it and we've labeled it. We put it as a stigma up on the church. Preacher, I'll show up on any Sunday, just don't preach on giving. Now that prosperity stuff. You know what the word prosper means in Greek? I'll put it up on the screen for you. It means to help along the road. So the root meaning in Greek, when somebody said prosper, somebody here saw somebody else with a heavy burden, and they would say, would you mind if I came over and helped lift your heavy burden? That's what prosper meant. I'm going to ask you all today, is there anybody in the room other than this pastor that would love for God to come along and prosper me in such a way that he lifts a heavy load today? He lifts a heavy load. But let me give it to you in Hebrew. Not just Greek, let me give it to you in Hebrew. You know what the word prosper means in Hebrew? To push forward. Do you see how we have this negative slant Prosper, prosperity. Yet the true meaning means I'm going to come alongside of you and I'm going to take something heavy off of you and help you. And in its truest Hebrew sense, it means I'm going to get behind you and I'm going to push you forward. How many would love for God to get behind some of our marriages and our finances and our business 
and our careers and our health and our relationships. Come on, somebody, and help push us forward.